we're going to have a nice little chat with the entities who created this movie. Will you please welcome the man behind the lens, Mr. Mitch Jenkins. <laughs> And from beyond, Mr. Alan Moore. Okay, we're going to be taking questions from the various beings, entities and creatures in the audience, but I get to ask a couple of my own first. And the first one I'd like to ask is... What the fuck is it about Northampton? <laughs> well, that's, uh, that's a very good question, Charlie. Um, I've managed to get quite a bit of mileage out of attempting to answer it for the past 20 years or so. Um, Northampton, it's kind of, as my book, Jerusalem, forthcoming, uh, shortly available, <laughs> <laughs> uh, that is kind of suggesting that Northampton is the centre of the country and also kind of implying that it's, it's also the centre of the, the known universe. And I know that, that sounds contentious, but I think that I have got um, a lot of evidence to back that up. Uh, you, you wouldn't want the argument, believe me. It's, uh, uh, Northampton, it seems to be... I mean, considering we don't even get a mention on the local weather maps. <laughs> you know, they talk, they talk about Corby or Kettering, you know, maybe where tomorrow. Yeah. I, know, I know what you mean. I currently live in Ipswich and I have to try and figure out what our weather's going to be because we're sort of a little below Norwich and a little above London. We don't count. Is Ipswich in England? <laughs> Well, last time I checked, my passport's expired and no one's come knocking on the door at 3 a.m. It so. must be then. It's sort of... Yeah, it's... I mean, I tend to think of Northampton as a kind of parallel capital. Uh, I mean, sorry, London, but I just do. It's... Uh, I mean, King Alfred Great, who wasn't called the Great because of... <laughs> you know, he sort of... He wasn't called the Great because of his hairstyle. You know, and he said that we were foremost amongst the shires. Uh, so we were the capital, and then the Normans, David Cameron's probable ancestors, <laughs> they all arrived and spoiled everything. Uh, but we're trying to sort of wrest back some of our former stature. So, Mitch, when did, when did you fall into the orbit of the, Northampt uh, you know, the Northampton Crusade? I mean, you're, I, you're not from... Not originally from there, I but mean, I've been I, there for just way too long. I have it on good authority that you spent some time in Suffolk. I did indeed. And so were you Suffolk and proud? Indeed. But now, uh, now you've become an honorary member um, of the crusade to restore Northampton to its rightful place at the centre not only of the known universe but of all <laughs> parallel universes and neighbouring galaxies. Yeah, I think you're both stunned, guys. <laughs> that, that is really a reach, Charlie, isn't it? Yeah. Me. But uh, I'm going along with it. You know. <laughs> no, no, I've been there for some years and, uh, you know, obviously uh, kind of like hanging out there, it's nice and easy. And also, with Alan being just around the corner, we get to drink copious amounts of tea and have the occasional cigarette, and um, yeah, and get things done. So what, what was the particular finger that flicked on the switch that illuminated the light bulb that is this thing we have just watched? <laughs> well, I mean, like Mitch, uh, he called around my house for uh, tea and cigarettes, as he <laughs> diplomatically calls them. And, um, <laughs> He was saying that he was getting kind of bored with having this really brilliant job, photographing celebrities, making huge amounts of money, not having a care in the world. And I said, Mitch, I can rescue you from that. <laughs> you, know, uh, you know, he wanted to sort of, uh, to show what he could do as a filmmaker. So I said, well, what, you know, use 
want to do a little 10 minute film for your show? Right? Yeah, it was based on our shoot we did for Dodge and Logic, the yeah. burlesque shoot. Yeah. And I said, well, would you like a screenplay for that? And he said, well, it couldn't hurt. And, yeah, uh, five years later. Yeah, here we are. It's, uh, I, I mean, originally, it was just Jimmy's End, which was a 10 minute film. And I believe that there is a recording of me reading all the parts, even the women, and it's in 10 minutes, you know. I'll blame a lot of the length of the film to his rather... Self-indulgence. Yeah, yeah, yeah self-indulgence and leisurely directing, sort of. But, uh, so, originally, Jimmy's End was a complete short story with a twist ending um, where, yeah, they're God and the Devil kind of of. <laughs> and um, then we were asked, well, could you expand this into, say, maybe a feature film and um, perhaps a television series? And I said, well, no. Um, obviously, we've given away the whole... There's a punchline to a, a short story. We've given away everything. Once you've revealed their God and the devil, where can you possibly go from there? Um, and then I kind of, my vanity was stung, and I thought, really? well, if, if I'm, I, I do possess a certain amount of, I know that wouldn't have been noticeable, no. but, um, yeah, I thought, actually, if I am the kind of transcendent, godlike genius that I probably <laughs> suppose myself to be, I would be able to think of a way around that. Um, so, I thought, well, maybe they're not God of the devil. Perhaps they're just pretending to be God and the devil. And um, it kind of expanded from there. Uh, we have got this, it's just grown through all of these different stages. We've been through various people trying to get this thing made as we imagine it. Um, there is some good news on that front. Things, it's looking very promising at the moment that the feature film might actually get made. Um, That's what happens I thought this was the feature film. Or is no. there, are these just the demos? No, no, no. These no, are no. the demos, yeah. Yeah, yeah practically, yeah. yeah. It's, uh, That's what happened next. And uh, yes, I was written the screenplay for the feature film, <laughs> what happens the next day. And we're very, very close, yeah. we think, to actually getting that sorted. I mean, basically, all the stuff in the those three films and the two other short films that... Um, are included in the, the DVD package. That all happens upon a Friday night in November in 2011. Yeah. Uh, the feature film starts on the Saturday morning after the Friday night before, and uh, a hilarious mix-up ensues. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, it's looking more and more possible by the moment. So I was worried when you said, you know, that. You know, there's going to be a feature film, this wasn't it. I was thinking, you know, your, does that mean that in the feature film your role is going to be played by Robert Downey Jr.? Uh, yeah. Well, of course, we approached him, but he was busy. Uh, no, we're, we're doing this... The, the main, one of the most unusual things about the film is the, the fact that we're doing it the way that we're doing it. Um, we are uh, basically... We are only going to do this film if we can do it exactly the way we want, with the people that we want. And we've been kind of resistant to big name stars because... And huge amounts of money. And yes, we've been offered huge amounts of money if we could have a big name star attached to it. And then rewrite just a little bit. Just, and the yeah. big fight scene at the end. The big fight scene yeah. at the end, the explosions. <laughs> you know, um, but we have resisted all that because... I don't know, I, I personally feel that a big name celebrity, um, the audience are going to be thinking, oh, well, yeah, I saw him in, um, in Pirates of the Caribbean or, or this or that. They're not going to actually be believing in the character. Uh, so we wanted mostly, uh, mostly local people. Uh, I know that that does sound a bit League of Gentlemen, but... <laughs> That is the kind of town that Northampton actually is. So, uh, yeah, we've got our cast. I mean, as, as we go on to the feature film, there'll be more people drawn in. But we still want people 
not for their faces or their names, but just for their, their acting. Mm. To actually be the characters we want them to be. Yeah. <coughs> so, so is that uh, is, is that is that night is that nightclub the terrible nightclub going uh, going to remain? Oh no, completely. I mean, our production designer walked into that room. Um, we'd hired it. I think we were paying about fifty quid a day to rent the Jimmy's End, but we had had their catering. And on the first day, everyone left the set and went to McDonald's because they hated the catering. <laughs> but the production designer walks in and he goes, "Fuck me, Mitch!" He goes, "This set." He goes, "Hundred grand to build this." So yeah, we will be actually using it over and over again for fifty quid a day. It's That's like this is one of the beauties about using Northampton as one of the main characters in all this. It's like. Yeah, this is the Jimmy's End Working Men's Club, uh, where time just stopped. And they also had, what, what did they have when we were filming? There was a wake? Oh uh, yeah, that was, that was the best thing. It was, um, well, I say the best. <laughs> uh, but we, when they were serving up the, uh, the pub food that we were using as kind of a, a buffet for the performers, I'd come down to the club to sort of check out what was going on and uh, I walked in and there was there were all of our wonderful burlesque girls. There was Andy, our sinister six foot five clown. <laughs> uh, there was all of our exotics, and um, there was just this one family sitting down the other end of the pub, <laughs> which was, and, and they they didn't really look that that pleased about the um, the burlesque girls and the clowns and everything. And I was saying, oh, you know, what's, what's the one with them? They've got I said, yeah, that, 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 that's a wake. Because <laughs> um, that's Northampton, they refused to stop. So they carried on, the club carried on. They kicked us out of the, um, the main room. Because it was Skittles night. Night. Skittles night. So we had to walk the kids out just for about four hours so they could have Skittles. And that is how it should be, because after all, it is their pub. Yeah. You know? Um, but, yeah, it's kind of... Uh, it was interesting working there, and yes, we're definitely going to be carrying on working there because, like Mitch said, time had stopped in the mid 70s. They'd still got that brown and orange 1970s decor. It, it's marvellous. You can't buy that kind of quality. You can, 100 grand. <laughs> <laughs> we were talking earlier on about the based on something you said in one of the bonus features uh, about, the move, uh, about the permeable membrane between fiction and the real world. And you talked about a fiction sort of bleeding into the real world. And I asked about, you know, when it works the, when it works the other way, we're used to it working the other way around. So, do you, want, uh, do you want to expand on that? Yeah, I do. It's actually... Now, I know that this might be difficult to believe from people who know me and my work, but I, I do have hidden agendas. <laughs> it's, uh, now, with, with this, um, you might have noticed in Act of Faith there was a bottle of vodka on the table that was called Tunguska. Uh, I think Not a brand with which I'm familiar, and I have done some research. Yeah, well, it's sort of the uh, this. For people who aren't familiar, Tunguska was the site, I think, in 1908, of a massive meteor strike. Uh, I think that the the strap line for the advert for the particular brand of vodka would be Tunguska. It will flatten you. <laughs> uh, but this is everything in the film. There was other products that you probably couldn't because they were kind of glancing. Um, everything in that particular world, in the world of the film, everything is made up. Uh, all of the songs, uh, which we gave the credits to all of the various recording artists and their label at the end, they don't exist. <laughs> no, that, that's, that's all I'm, I'm right for. God's sake, can't. <laughs> Giving it away. <laughs> but, uh, and um, what we thought of, I mean, I tend to think of advertising as evil and the work of Satan. Uh, but I was thinking, actually, what if we just make up a load of things? Um, make up an entire culture. All the music, the, the, the kind of...
kind of the lads' magazines, um, everything. The uh, the crappy CGI movies that you see trailers for, everything. And uh, one of the things that we made up was um, an energy drink called Fuel Rods. I thought, you know, it would just be a thinner, slightly longer can, and it will be a bright fluorescent day glow green, so that it was really toxic. I thought, yeah, I'd buy that. That, that sounds like it. And then we actually got one of the big uh, energy drink manufacturers. Who's so, Monster? Yeah. yeah. Saying, um, yeah, if you put that in your film, then we'll make it. <laughs> uh, and I thought, actually, this, this is kind of, that's what product placement in reverse, isn't it? <laughs> and I thought, yeah, actually, smuggling, it, it's like we set up a kind of an export station in the imagination, which we can then export things into what is laughingly described as the real world. Um, yeah, admittedly, things like energy drinks, that's not very important. The, the world probably doesn't need that much more in the way of energy drinks. But if we can establish that principle, then there might be all sorts of things that we could import into the real world. Who knows? Um, so, so, yeah, so blurring the lines. Yeah, yeah this is, that's what it's all about. Um, the, the actual the content, the story, is all about this kind of uh, dream club and its inhabitants, some of whom are attempting to badly mix up the borders between dream and reality. And I suppose that we're <coughs> basically trying to do the same thing, only we're not evil. Second opinion. I mean, it's... It's sort of, uh, I, like, I like the sort of reversal whereby uh, people go, yeah, I get it, they're dead. And then it goes into this whole <coughs> other thing where, um, so, it, so it isn't, it's a spin on the trope, yeah. so to speak, just as people are patting themselves on the back for spying it. Yeah. Well, it's like the original short 10 minute thing to go with Richie's, Richie's film for his showreel. That was um, that. That was exactly what it was. That was the payoff. Oh, they're, they're secretly dead, and this is some kind of ante room to the afterlife. But once we started to think beyond that, all right, if they're not dead, what the hell is going on? Well, no, if not, they are dead. They are dead. <laughs> uh, but if this is not God and the devil. If this is not some sort of genuine afterlife, what is going on? And the way that we thought of, as that kind of idea expanded and the things that it grew into, um, yeah, it's it's we've got a complete story worked out because one of the things that I despise is those television programs where. They've clearly not thought it through. They clearly don't have an ending. Um, they're just making up weird things every week, which will then immediately be forgotten about by the lazy script writers. And yes, I'm looking at you, Lost. <laughs> um, what we wanted to do was to... <coughs> we have... If there is a television series following the film, if the film gets made, then... We know what the last shot is in the last episode. He does. I do. I know. I, I've told him that he doesn't really actually... He's smoking those cigarettes again. ...attention to what I'm saying. It's, uh, yeah, so this is a complete story. We've worked out every element of it. Uh, you don't have to worry that um, we're just going to have... I don't suppose that you youngsters would remember not landing. But that was a soap opera where at the end of it, because the plot lines were so screwed up, they had aliens come down <laughs> and just take the, uh, the main characters away to another and happier world. <laughs> you know, the, no, we're not going to be doing that. Shame. Yeah. <laughs> Actually thinking about it, that's, that's, that's a good idea. I'll take the credit. Yeah, I think before, before, we, before the 
um, floor vanishes and all, um, all y'all are dropped to the fiery um, fate which you've undoubtedly earned. We have a few minutes left during which you will be sort of semi-alive. So during those ten minutes, has anybody got a question for Mitch and or Alan? And if so, because I'm not as young as I used to be, if so, can you either shout very loudly or come down the front and take this mic? Ah, oh, there's a number. There is a microphone. There is a microphone fairy who will bring it to you. Okay, uh, gentleman in the striped shirt and the non-striped glasses in the second row. Hi. Um, given the uh, mixed results of adaptations of your other work, is it satisfying to you know, show them how it's done? Well, I wasn't actually trying to show them how it's done because I barely have any idea who they are. <laughs> um, I, I haven't, I've, I've not been taking a lot of notice of uh, my, my film career other than this film. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm not fond of adaptations in general. There are exceptions. But generally, I'd prefer it if things were left in the medium that they were created for. Um, especially, say, just as an example for no particular reason, comics that have very, very definitely been written to show off what the comics medium can do rather than what the film medium can try to do. Uh, with this, I started thinking, okay, what are the things that you can only do in film? Um, that's been a real educational process, you know, I've, it's a different form of writing. I mean, like, uh, with uh, something like a comic script, when I've got my little scribbly page of drawings and dialogue notes, when I've got that finished, I pretty much know what the entire uh, of the comic is going to look like. Um, <laughs> That's not the same as with a film. No, because he gives it to me. <laughs> well, well, that's true. It's like when you're writing the screenplay for a film, it's just that's like the ground plan of a building, and you have to get it right, but you have to do it with the awareness that the director, the cameraman, the actors, that everybody will be bringing some of their own vision to it, and they will be building upon your ground plan but it's not going to be, you've got to enter into it with a, I mean, yes, I, I suppose I am a bit of a control freak in terms of, I really like in comics, my vision to be exactly as I imagine it. Is it, pardon me interrupting, is it true, Alan, that you once wrote 25 pages to describe one panel, or is this an urban myth? No, that is an urban myth. It's sort of, uh, I did once write um, ten pages. Actually, that was to describe one panel, but it was a very, very big panel. <laughs> um, and I've kind of, I've, I've kind of tried to cut that down because I'm, I'm an old man, and life isn't going to go on forever. So I, I am now uh, kind of working. It's about a page per page. Um, very stripped down, but no, I mean, like the the film thing, it's been a real education, and uh, it's, yeah, I'm not, like I say, I'm not bothered about, uh, I've never seen them, and I'm never going to, so I'm not really competing uh, with them, this is, this is a different sort of cinema, I mean, the film critic Barry Norman, who, all right, he wasn't, the, he wasn't Pauline Kael, he wasn't the greatest film critic in the world, but he was a good average British film critic. He quit, um, and he said, yeah, I'm retiring because I've seen the future of film, and it is just endless American superhero franchises. Um, yeah, I don't really want to subscribe, to, I don't want to live in a world like that. So that's why we're doing um, these, these films. Yep, uh, right, uh, right, in, right in front of me, I've got, uh, my, gl my glasses are going bad, so, oh, we found you, good. 
Um, yeah. Well, there are so many afterlives to draw from with all their own different ways of judging someone. Why was it that you chose the Egyptian method in particular? Because the Egyptians, unless there are some others that I haven't really heard of, the Egyptians are the wackiest. <laughs> um, and I mean, my, that uh, Andy the Clown, his reading from the Egyptian Book of the Dead, yet that was, that's not an authentic reading because there are lots and lots of different Egyptian Books of the Dead and to find there isn't really um, a standard model. So what we did was, all of that phraseology that is taken straight from the Egyptian Book of the Dead, I've just composed it a little bit. But I mean like that, the little um, Anubis head on top of, that he'd got on a rubber, I mean it's just great, I mean cod <laughs> Egyptian stuff. Um, the, the record that they put on and play, um, this was uh, Natasha Atlas, Natasha Atlas yeah. Northampton girl who performed with Jar Wobble. Who you and didn't invent. Is, sorry? Who, one of the artists you did not invent. No, it's who actually real. exists. Yeah, Jar Wobble is actually real. Um, <laughs> he, uh, but yeah, I mean we've got uh, Nafi Atlas along to sort of, because uh, she does great Egyptian warbling. Um, it was fantastic, and yeah, I mean, it, the Egyptians, they're also, as the, uh, the clown says in there, good with makeup, but fucking morbid. <laughs> um, there's, I mean, where could you get something like the Devourer of the Dead, except from Egypt, or in our case, from the, the wrestling circuit? Yeah, it was. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Stephen Petty, the wrestler. Yeah, he was great. That's how I'd like my gods to look. <laughs> um, lady over there in the blue denim shirt. Yup, you. You're the one. Hi, Nick. Um, I'm interested in the, in the. Is the Khan is it symbolic or worded in the form of Khan? And um, I'm also interested in how. You use Kickstarter for funding this film. How can you explain why you chose it? Thank you. Sorry, sorry, could you go, uh, my, my hearing's a bit cold. Oh, okay. I, I just... So, why do you choose the clown as a symbol of the afterlife? Right. Well, um, everybody's a bit creeped out by clowns, <laughs> aren't they? I mean, uh, we always say that we like them and appreciate the great artistry that goes into it, but we wouldn't want one moving in next door to us. It's, I just thought, yeah, clowns, there is something sinister about them, and yet they are very funny. Um, they're borderline menacing. All clowns are borderline menacing. It's a, you're not entirely comfortable if there's a clown in the room. <laughs> um, or perhaps I'm not, anyway, you know. But uh, what was interesting was that um, we got quite a bit worked out about that clown, and we were planning at one point to do um, a series of short films called Clown Town, which would just be our clown appearing in menacing, creepy vignettes around Northampton, and um, we were planning this. So uh, beat us to it. And then I went away on holiday to Centre Parks, like a normal person, <laughs> and uh, I, I came back, and I think my brother phoned me up, and uh, he said, what's all this about the clown, Murray? Because he calls me Murray, I call him Murray, we, we just, we come from a poor background where we could only afford the one nickname. <laughs> and I said, what clown? Um, he said, there's been a clown in the paper. It appears to have materialised at the end of your street. Um, it's going viral on the internet. And I said, what? Um, and he repeated it, and I probably said, what, a few more times. But then I checked it out, and there'd been pictures in the paper of this clown 
standing there in the middle of the night with um, a helium balloon by a post box that is about 20 yards from my front door. <laughs> Mitch was getting emails saying, so is this you and Alan? Uh, <laughs> this clown thing. Um, and that's almost a kind of a proof that of our basic theory that there is a very thin membrane between fiction and reality. You know, kind of, we made up this creepy clown appearing in vignettes around Northampton, and then we get a real one. <laughs> um, I suppose if you have been used to having your characters turning up at political demonstrations all over the world, it's perhaps a bit less unexpected, but still, the clown was a surprise. <laughs> but I suppose that's the nature of clowns. <laughs> Since the witching hour seems to be almost striking, do we I appeal to the powers that be? Do we have time for any more questions? Five minutes. Okay, let's let's try to let's try to favour other sides of the room, even though it involves more of me walking. Um, gentleman that in the front here with the evil clown t-shirt on, albeit a corporately owned evil clown. Uh, hi Alan, hi Mitch. Hi. Um, do you think that St Peter's Working Men's Club is now going to get an increase? James. Sorry, St James. St James. St James's uh, Working Men's Club is now going to get an increase in membership, or do you think people will be terrified and sort of steer clear of it now? I would imagine that the two things will perhaps balance out, <laughs> um, and so that it will actually there'll be very little real change at all. Um, one thing about the club. Uh, our producer, Pete Coogan, uh, one of our producers, uh, when we were shooting it, he said, you know, I actually grew up in Northampton. He said, I, I moved here when I was a teenager. He said, I hated being at school. I was just longing for the day when I could quit and go to work somewhere. And he said, so I ended up working in the Metoy factory uh, in Northampton, which was down here in Jimmy's End. And he said, and I'd sit there in my lunch break and, and I'd look across the road to where the St James's End Working Men's Club was. And I'd sit there and I'd think, I wonder what they're doing there. <laughs> and uh, so, in many ways, the whole of the film is a, just a way of answering Pete's question. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I, I mean, it, it certainly hasn't hurt. Northampton's such an apathetic place. I mean, you, know, you may, <laughs> maybe get ten people turn up, then after that, you're like, oh, forget that. And there, there's much more terrifying places than that in Northampton. Yeah, soon to be discovered in the feature film. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I think we've got time for one normal-sized question or two incredibly short ones. Uh, so, who's got an incredibly short question? Nobody's got an incredibly short question. Who's got a normal-sized question? Um, Green, uh, green dress, purple hair. Yes. Hi. Um, I really enjoyed the character of Faith, but I just wanted to talk about. Okay. Yeah. I really wanted to talk about um, the whole moralistic kind of feeling towards um, consensual, non-consensual, in sort of the fetish way, um, and what you would like to say about that. It's just. It was something that struck me that was interesting, but I just wondered where that came from. Well, we, when we originally came up with the idea for, Acts of Faith was written after Jimmy's End. Uh, Jimmy's End had got the character of Faith in it, who's obviously ended up down there somehow. Um, we wanted to do um, a short film just to show what we could do to try and get something rolling on the bigger films. Um, so I wrote a very, very short film with one actor and one set. One set, yeah. Uh, the, the idea of, I mean, it's all entirely consensual. Um, sort of her, her act of you know, bondage and sort of role playing. Um, but it goes, I'm not sure, I don't think there's, we didn't mean to suggest that there was a moral attitude in it. This wasn't like those horror films 
where you, the couple that has sex, they're going to die first <laughs> because they've had sex, and then it will probably be the black guys. <laughs> uh, we, we, we're not subscribing to that. Uh, what Faith is just a young woman. She, she's got certain issues in her past that, as with all of us, tend to direct and colour her behaviour. And she just gets unlucky the way that some people do. And she ends up in this dreadful dream club. Now, uh, I don't want to give any spoilers away, but Faith, her, her story isn't finished. Um, there's, uh, she is one of the main continuing characters. Um, and so we definitely weren't sort of trying to imply that, oh yes, she's died and gone to hell because she did rude things. Uh, that wasn't what we were saying. Um, it was just, this is a part of, of normal life. It's a part of culture, it's a part of life. It's stuff that happens. And uh, sometimes autoerotic experiments, perhaps too often, they do go wrong. And so we were just using that as a, as a plot device without any kind of moral weight behind it, you know. I hope that answers your question. I think our time is up. Well, yours definitely is. <laughs> so, uh, pass the word out about the movie you've seen. Uh, remember Alan Moore's Jerusalem coming soon and those who are about to read salute it, albeit with some trepidation. So, you know, as, you, as, your, as your time comes to an end, you know, go and sin no more. But first, please give noises of loud appreciation for Mitch Jenkins and Alan Moore. And Joshua Murray. Thank you very much.